Hayes, and I am head of family office for Armanino. Uh, Armanino is a, a national top 20 consulting and accounting firm focused on six key industries, including family offices. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, I'm here with my colleague, OJ Laos as well as the, the founders of uh, Collation AI. And, um, and so I'd like to introduce both Tanmai and Manish uh, and uh, have them first give their backgrounds and then we'll jump into uh, how Collation AI can help uh, family offices. So Tanmai, if, 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 if we could start with you, if you could just give us your background and what you know, where did you get started and what mm -hmm. led you to to founding Collation AI? Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, first of all, great to be here and thank you for uh, calling us. Um, my name is Tanmay. I am actually a banker pretending to be a fintech guy. So I spent 20 years on various uh, trading floors, um, uh, always on front office trading roles, buy, sell, cross border arbitrage, that kind of thing. Uh, then 20 years ago, uh, sorry, 10 years ago, I uh, or got bored of banking, quit, and started a company out of Singapore called uh, Canopy. Uh, we were in the family office wealth aggregation uh, space, uh, and uh, we we did quite okay, uh, reporting at about 170 billion in assets, 300 plus family offices, 20% uh, owned by Credit Suisse, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You, were, uh, you guys were really, Canopy was really big in Asia, right? That, yeah, was... That, well, that was our sort of home ground. We were all based out of Singapore. Um, then um, I always wanted to break into the U.S. market, so um, so we spun out of Canopy middle of last year, July last year, um, and uh, I relocated to the U.S. and uh, we are solving an adjacent but a slightly different problem. So um, sorry, Manish, you want to go first, and then I go into the problem. Yeah, Manish, why don't you give us your your background and and how you uh, got involved with Canopy, or uh, sorry, with uh, uh, relation. Yes. So uh, Tanmay and I went to business school together uh, 30 years ago or thereabouts and uh, have stayed in touch since. Um, so when uh, Tanmay was in Singapore with Canopy and was looking to uh, relocate to the US, uh, it was about the time that I had also started my own sort of advisory firm, if you may. It's called Utsa, Utsa Advisor. So and I started working with Tanmay to help him with thinking through of what it would take to move Canopy to the US and helped uh, him set up, uh, I mean, he did all the work, but uh, connected <laughs> to him with a few people that I knew that helped him set up uh, Collation here in uh, in North America. Um, yeah, and I've been working with Tanmay uh, ever since uh, Collation was set up and prior to that for a few months when he was with Canopy as well, but I'm working with him in his efforts to uh, uh, head out to potential clients prospects uh, here in North America. Uh, leveraging whatever connections I have in this space. Awesome. Hey, and I, I forgot to, in my intro, I forgot to mention my colleague, uh, OJ, who is here with us as well. And he's our in-house AI expert. And I thought it was important to bring mm -hmm. him into this uh, conversation, just given how innovative uh, Collation AI is in the, the family office space and its application of, of AI technology. Uh, anyway, thanks. So going back to, uh, uh, so when I relocated to the US, uh, we are trying to solve a similar but an adjacent problem. Uh, what we realized is that the US market is very deep and liquid um, and uh, infrastructure is fairly well developed. So every client we were going into already had a tech stack. And uh, in fact, the problem was not what tech stack to install. The problem was that my tech stack is doing 80, 90% of what I want. And the last 10% is being done in Excel. And uh, there is a lot of uh, stress around it. So so for background there though, tell tell us this, this, give us a little bit more insight into the status quo of mm -hmm. these tech stacks. I mean, what what applications are we talking about and and sure what so when are? when you are uh, when you are uh, uh, focused on a family office and looking at their tech stack uh, there will invariably be a general ledger system because you know everybody has to pay taxes and mm -hmm. you know uh, so there will invariably be a, a gl system and a process around it sometimes uh, you know it's in house sometimes it's outsourced sometimes it's a combination but there is usually a fairly elaborate process around the general ledger uh, there is also an investment process 
uh, in the investment process is sometimes uh, there is a separate uh, system uh, like a portfolio management systems. Sometimes there isn't. It's purely in Excel. Uh, sometimes, so we see all permutation and combinations. So effectively, the way I would describe the uh, tech stack is lots of Excel everywhere. Uh, definitely a journal ledger. Maybe, maybe not a portfolio management system. And a little bit of chaos in data going around because data is sitting in various places. Uh, and one fundamental problem that family offices uh, suffer with is a journal ledger is designed to do financial statements. It's not really designed to do investment reporting. That's not the function. Um, so converting a GL into investment reporting is a very, very common problem that we come across. So that's the tech stack. Now, the GL system itself can vary. It varies from... QuickBook to Sage to Business Central to um, Archway to AllView. And, you know, so the whole uh, uh, spectrum is there and uh, people, uh, depending on what their preferences, people, different people use different things. Yeah, so in, in portfolio management, what, what applications are you... When you, so, when you uh, uh, I think the the biggest market share is obviously Adipar, uh, and after that you see um, other uh, software, uh, but uh, you see them lesser. As in, I think uh, the Adipar market share is uh, by far the, way, yeah. the biggest. Um, but otherwise, you have, um, and you also have these uh, combined systems where you know they try and do the GL and investment reporting uh, in one shot. But that also creates its own uh, set of issues. Yeah, like Archway would be uh, like like Archway and um, all these guys. Where um, I think it's a function of how you basically arrange your data. So if your data is arranged as a journal ledger then you will always do financial statements better than you will do investment reporting. And if your data is arranged as a trade blotter, then you will always do investment reporting better than you will do general. It's a, uh, it's a fundamental fact of life. You can't do anything about it. Right, right, right. So, so, okay. So, so how does collation uh, come into this environment and, um, Make so, uh, uh, so the way we are looking at the problem is you have a tech stack. We are not consultants. So we will just take the tech stack as it is. And it is doing 80% of what you wanted it to do. And the last 20% uh, is what is missing. Um, and there are basically two ways of solving the problem. One is to try and make your existing tech stack dance in a way it wasn't designed to do, which is always hard. Uh, or to do what we are doing, which is we simply data warehouse the whole thing. So we create a separate data warehouse for every customer. Uh, we set up a continuous process of syncing and validating data with the various sources. So whether you have a GL, a portfolio system, Excel, all of the above, SharePoint files, uh, custodian data feeds, doesn't matter. All of it uh, continuously 24-7 goes into a managed data warehouse. Uh, which is exclusive for that customer. So, uh, and then once the data is in one place, you can do a lot of things with it. So effectively what we are trying to do in a very philosophical way is uh, instead of trying to make your journal ledger system dance or your portfolio system dance in a way it wasn't designed to, get the data out and make the data dance in a data warehouse, which exactly is the purpose of a data warehouse. Uh, and this solves the problem very, very rapidly. So we usually deploy in two days and we are done in two weeks. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and so, so, right. But you've got all these disparate data systems and you, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the challenge, like when we're working in a G, an ERP or a GL system, you know, the challenge mm -hmm. is like, there's no concept of IRR or information mm -hmm. ratio mm -hmm. or beta or any mm -hmm. of these things that are, mm -hmm. you know, kind of de facto calculated results inside of Adipar or yeah. Mm -hmm. any one of the the the, mm -hmm. the portfolio uh, reporting systems mm -hmm. uh, but that's our problem right because um uh, uh, as long as we have the underlying data which is basically your transactions holdings and uh, positions which is easy to get from the journal ledger we calculate the uh, the difference so all the irr twr uh, public market equivalents and uh, the j curve and uh, you know asset allocation and evolution of your risk over time and um, all that not a problem uh, these things are uh, easy once we have the data. But like a GL system typically doesn't, like they're not going to have the benchmark data. So how? Um, uh, uh, so again, this is again where the data warehouse uh, comes in. Uh, so we are not trying to make the GL system dance, right? We are simply getting 
data from the jail system which is the jail system is very good at um, and then you are enriching the data with price sources from outside Okay. Um, uh, we are enriching the data with data sources from outside. So when I say, um, and if you want to have a, a slide in which I can explain, uh, you know, how this works, uh, but basically, um, so take a simple example, right? So I have a general ledger system, which has, I don't know, uh, 100 entities with, you know, five, six investments each. Um, and I now need to make, you know, comparative uh, assessment of how I did. And I want to compare myself to the market, right? Standard problem. Right. So the way you will do it is you'll take all the data from the general ledger, put it into a data warehouse, run all the calculations, uh, enrich the data warehouse with uh, market data. So this is benchmarks um, and other stuff. Sometimes the client has uh, their own classifications and their own benchmarks, which are not in the GL system, but they have it in Excel. So all that goes into the data warehouse. And after that, it's a question of simply um, displaying it. So, so, so that's a key innovation. Sorry, OJ, uh, go ahead and jump in. Yeah, I was going to hop in because we talked about how you can do more with the data when it's in the centralized location. <laughs> it's more than that because the sum is greater than the parts because yeah. since everything's in one place, it's not just manipulating the data in new ways for new reports, but it's doing things you just couldn't do, correct? Mm -hmm. If you were still in the GL or whatever the system was. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And, and also to clarify, we the GL remains a source of truth. So we are not saying that, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is the data warehouse shows a different number and the GL shows a different number. And, you know, you essentially created a brand new problem for your client. So uh, what we guarantee is extremely high fidelity back to the source. So uh, if the client wants to change a transaction detail, you only change it in your main system. The rest is managed by us. Um, so you, we, we are trying to, you know, sort of simplify the problem rather than create, uh, you know, create noise. So, uh, so that becomes very important that the source of truth remains the source of truth because there is a whole uh, team whose whole focus is on making sure the GL is correct. So if they are doing all that effort, then, you know, we just work from there. Right, 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 right. So, okay. So, so, but, but the key is that all the legacy systems, right? The, the, the GL system, the, they, they've never thought about tracking the number of securities or the benchmark related to that security or any of this data that you're, you're basically using the data where you're, you're using a data warehouse to enrich in that accounting data in order to be able to extend it into the, 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 the portfolio yeah. reporting types. Exactly. Uh, but what the GL system is doing and is doing very well is it's capturing all the immutable facts. You bought uh, Tesla shares, so many shares on this day at this price, immutable fact, and that's caught uh, in the GL system and it's gone with us. So once I'm getting it from the GL system, I don't have to worry that, did you actually buy it? Did they get the price right? Maybe you know they got the broker wrong. No, I don't need to worry about it. Uh, I only need to worry about is that what happened to Tesla price from that day onwards. That's, you know, in the scheme of things is a relatively easy problem to solve. Right, right, right. So, so um, this, I, can I demonstrate this in a? In yeah, a absolutely. Yeah, feel feel free to share a screen. So uh, we like to think of ourselves as the aspirin for your headache. Um, so that's our kind of uh, logo. Is we are the aspirin for your data headache. Um, in fact, okay. Some people say it's Alka Seltzer, but anyway. Um, and we say no surgery needed. So we don't go in and say throw away your jail system, get another one, or get a portfolio management. That's not the idea. The idea is to be aspirin. You you eat the aspirin and your headache goes away. That's it. And it has to happen like that. So like I said, we deploy in two days and we solve it in two weeks. So uh, problem we're trying to solve is there's a portfolio system, there is a CRM system, there's a GL system, and there are data sources. Uh, when we're dealing with RIAs, it's usually the portfolio system doesn't talk to my CRM system. That's the problem. Uh, when we're talking to family offices, it's usually I have a GL system and I may or may not have a portfolio system. I have a bunch of data sources and I need to make sense of all of these. So what the clients need to do is obviously data needs to be reconciled across um, silos um, and uh, workflows need to be triggered. So if certain thing happens in one data source, I need the following workflow to uh, happen. And of course, the question is who owns your data? Is your data with your accounting system or is it with you? So that's kind of the problem. So the way we solve, or the way currently is solved is you throw people at it, right? You, know, you hire a few more people and uh, spend a lot of money. Uh, the way we solve it is a simple aspirin solution, which is we take your data, put it in a data warehouse, 
um, which is a complicated word for a database. Um, uh, and uh, you have full possession of your data because it's your data warehouse. So you give we give you full access. Um, all recon workflows, MIS, and obviously significant cost saving because a bunch of computers are doing the work which otherwise would have been done uh, by very expensive uh, humans. Um, and uh, so bots do all the work. So you take your data sources, uh, you have worker bots that will create the data warehouse, you have recon bots, you have investment reporting bots that will calculate any calculations that are missing. Uh, we also have auditor bots who will monitor data quality and tell you if you find bugs. Um, and this happens a lot because a GL system, uh, because it goes on discrete dates. So if your transaction went on 16th of November instead of going on 30th of November, it makes no difference to the GL, but it makes a material difference to the investment reporting. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so when you are doing GL on a time series and take the data and plot it, then all these kinks come out and then you get the client to fix it. So then, you know, the investment reporting and the GL, everything is in sync after that. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about that because that's mm -hmm. like, that is 90% of the errors. Like, you know, we we work across a number of the systems that you use in Adapar, mm -hmm. Quartz, Mastro, mm -hmm. um, Black Diamond, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the work is, is a lot, well, maybe not 90%, but it's a very significant fraction is mm -hmm. that trade date uh, challenge where, you know, um, I, state, I, I actually have a, date. I have a workflow for this exactly. Oh, perfect. Um, so, uh, I mean, this one I'm showing you is a recon between uh, your accounting system and your custodian. This is a, the first ask we get, but the second ask we get is uh, exactly this, that I have a general ledger system. Um, we take the data out, uh, we put it into a data warehouse, uh, we run all the calculations. So TWR, PNL, realized, unrealized, blah, blah, blah. We enrich it from external data. So you have a particular benchmark you want to track, not a problem. Um, and then we plot it. And uh, what will happen is that you will see these kinks. So what I'm showing you actually happened with a real client. I can't tell you who the client is, but this is real data. So what had happened was that the fund redemption um and uh the cash uh, so they booked the fund redemption a few days ahead or behind the yeah. cash coming back um and it's it looks perfectly fine on the gl but when you do the time series it it, it shows you a, a spike so um uh, but but uh, all these spikes stick out, right? So it's not like you have to do a lot of work to find them. You just plot your TWR uh, over time. Uh, you will figure out whether, uh, you know, these are the seven or eight bugs that I have. You fix them, you rerun the data, and everybody's happy. So you're, you're calculating some of the investment heuristics across different time series of data, right? So in, in the example you gave, the fund mm -hmm. redemption, right? From a cash basis, cash received by the GL system, mm -hmm. I just synchronized with the bank account. You would have seen that deposit. Mm -hmm. If you did TWR or MIC, mm -hmm. well, MIC doesn't have a time component mm -hmm. to it, but any of the uh, TWR, IRR, you mm -hmm. would have a different number potentially than what a portfolio accounting system that just saw the fund redemption at the date that the, the uh, fund reported. Uh, and there is one more source of error, which is that uh, your uh, fund manager, uh, let's say they have monthly liquidity, they will recognize cash only on the end of the month. So even if you send money on 16th of November, as right. far as the fund manager is concerned, it came on 30th. Right. Um, and and, and that makes yeah. a material difference to your, yeah, yeah. Uh, to your return. So, so you might say that, you know, the fund manager is reporting X and I'm getting Y, who is right? Um, yeah. And, um, and in, in a lot of these cases, there is no right or wrong answer, but you need to know uh, why that person is getting that number and why you are getting that number. And then you can decide, okay, I'll, I will match my investment manager or I will not. In fact, most of our clients prefer to match the investment manager. So what we then do in the data warehouse is we actually uh, automatically adjust the inflows, outflows to month end. Um, and then then the TWR ties out, ties out to the sink. Well, because I, I don't know if the regulator has ever, you know, regulator meaning the SEC has ever mm -hmm. commented on this from a, mm -hmm. from a regulated fund perspective. Because I do remember when I used to do uh, fund administration that... Mm -hmm. If the money came in before the fifteenth, you would you would use the prior month end uh, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in striking that nav, and mm -hmm. then if it came in after the fifteenth, you would use the the, yeah. the latter. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but I, I don't think in in you know from the investment manager's perspective, if it's if it's a gain, it's always better to recognize it sooner rather than later. Um, so, you know, yeah. a, a lot, just from their own, mm -hmm. if they're reporting out IRRs. Um, yeah. 
So we typically uh, see them trying to accelerate. But, uh, uh, this is a theme we are seeing. So right now we have clients on Archway, on AllView, on Sage, on QuickBooks, on Zero, on Business Central. Uh, all of them happy with the GL, want better investment reporting. So we are simply doing the overhead. So is, I mean, it sounds like you, you, you don't, Maybe, can we get rid of any systems? If you add Collation AI, does it reduce your tech stack at all or is it just um, supplement it? So, uh, okay. um, I will get into a lot of trouble to give you this um, uh, answer. Um, but the uh, what we suspect will happen, um, I don't know about getting rid of systems, but um, we definitely have clients who were who are on a GL, happy with the GL, and are considering buying a portfolio system. And we work out to be a small fraction of the cost, um, also a small fraction of the headache because uh, you already have a GL process which is ensuring your data is correct in the GL. And we are simply piggybacking off that process rather than asking you to re-enter data into a portfolio system and to kind of recalculate everything from scratch and then hope that you end up with the same result. Um, so, how do you get the data from the, the providers of the portfolio system information? So, for instance, like you you have a custodian somewhere. Mm -hmm, you no, know, the, the the really nice thing about using Black Diamond or Mastro is they they got the built in infrastructure in order mm -hmm. to get the data out of those. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and they they know how to mitigate some of the data hygiene issues. Yeah, right, yeah. The custodians report things differently depending upon which custodian you're using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they, because they're spread across lots of clients, you're kind of, you're benefiting from that cumulative knowledge mm -hmm. ar around mm -hmm. that custodian, as well as mm -hmm. corporate action comes through, it, mm -hmm. you know, with Adapar, they may have a thousand other clients that, mm -hmm. that have held that same security and, and yep. therefore they have to fix that corporate mm -hmm. action one time and it, it, and, and it happens, yeah. propagates across all of their their, their, their uh, instances uh, of Adapar versus you would have to do it, you know, onesie twosies. Uh, not really. And the reason I say that is, okay, first, like I said, we are not advising on tech stack. But let's assume that you only have a general ledger. Uh, invariably, you will have a team who's looking at every line in that general ledger and trying to uh, fix it and manually, not manually, automatic, whatever. And not only that, you're paying your taxes on the basis of that data. So, uh, so we take that data and we just build the investment reporting on top of it without having to worry about data consistency. So, in the normal course, you know, uh, out of the box, we are not having to worry about that because somebody else is worrying about it, and somebody else is so sure of their numbers that they have, you know, done filings on the back of it. So, uh, so that typically how it works. Uh, that said, when we are dealing with uh, portfolio systems uh, or uh, custodian uh, pipes, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, in uh, in Canopy, we were working with more than 300 custodians. And so very, very familiar with uh, the quirks of data feeds and what can go wrong and, you know, uh, the issues we have. In fact, on the Canopy website, I wrote a whole page on um, what goes wrong with data. So very, very familiar with what can go wrong. And, you know, I mean, finally, the, these are understood problems and understood solutions. If I could ask a quick mm -hmm. question, it, it almost seems like when we talk about what systems you can eliminate, it's not so much the systems, but the tasks in between them. Because obviously it wasn't just an integration, we had the bots. And I think that's an important distinction of what's happening between the systems and the kind of what you're well, you're automated. Yeah, you're, you're precisely correct. And and that's exactly what we're saying is we are here to remove your data headache. So you have a data headache and you're throwing people at the problem or a process at the problem. We are here to eliminate that. And uh, there are certain tasks that bots do better than humans and certain tasks humans do better. So the tasks that bots are better at, let the boss do it, right? I mean, why do you want to uh, do this? Um, Simply APIs don't solve the problem because uh, usually the workflows are a little bit more complex than, you know, let's say what a Zapier will do. Uh, mm -hmm. So having a data warehouse and running a bunch of calculations and then saying, okay, these are the changes needed uh, seems to be the right solution. We've experimented a lot and this seems to be what works. And it seems like, I mean, that's when we talk about the aspirin, because what mm -hmm. you typically see when you're looking at cloud system to cloud system is you're passing the buck. Yeah. My system doesn't align with your dates. Go figure it out over there, right? Or put it somewhere else. And here it's kind of just putting everything together and saying, let's solve the issue once and for all. Uh, exactly. And uh, also what we don't, uh, first, spot on. 
Uh, secondly, what we don't do is modify your data because then we are adding another source of error. Mm -hmm. So what we do do is we raise our hand and say, these two numbers don't match. Uh, you decide. And typically the client will spot on say, yep, we made a mistake here. Let's check the entry and you rerun it and everybody's happy. And then their confidence in their own numbers increases. And, you know, we, uh, it, it's a sort of a very positive thing all around where, uh, you know, we figured out what the issue was. We fixed it. Numbers are correct. So it's almost like a, an air correction overlay, right? Yeah. It's a fill in the blank overlay. So error mm -hmm. correction, and then you get the data lake. And then uh, if you want investment reporting, investment reporting, if you want workflows, workflows, um, uh, like uh, the most common requests we get from uh, family offices is visualize my GL into investment reporting. And the most common requests we get from RIAs is that my portfolio system and my CRM don't talk to each other as they're supposed to. So if this changes in the portfolio system, I need this workflow or the other. Yeah, that that that, that makes a lot of sense because I, I I mean your my experience is consistent with your explanation, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. you know, right now the industry is just throwing bodies at it, and I oh. you know oh. like in and 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 the you know. If I if we were to look at like you know we have a multi-tenant license Vatapar, so we have lots of clients mm -hmm. in Vatapar, and mm -hmm. you know the vast majority of the time once Vatapar is set up is mm -hmm. is all this error correction, right? And it's you know, so and uh, so I can tell you what all we're doing in Adapar, right? So for Adapar clients, uh, first one client we are who's a RIA, mm -hmm. we are uh, make so the client data in Adapar is correct and the CRM is not yet updated, so we are helping them sync those two databases. Um, then uh, people want the pricing of the real estate uh, update, updated in Adapar. They want their um, uh, recon to be done. So my uh, uh, my custodian uh, numbers and my Adapar numbers should uh, should tie out. Uh, and invariably, there's a bunch of so like for a client, we're doing a checks on did I leave something unclassified uh, or did I uh, is my cost basis the same as my custodian or so there is a bunch of checks. Now, all of these can be done by humans. Yeah, Adapar has a very nice screen. It'll show you the cost basis of every yeah. asset. Your custodian has a very nice screen. You can get, and you can do man manually, right? Except it'll take you one forever. Secondly, right. the it's very boring, uh, drudgery kind of work. So you you know you have a problem with motivating the person to do it, um, yes. and it's expensive because you're paying them by the hour. Um, our bots, um, you know, they, they are uh, so they will happily do it, and it'll take them they less than time to do it. You want them to do it five times a day, they'll happily do it five times a day. So, right. so there are certain problems that are very amenable to uh, solving uh, by bots. And and the idea here is, you know, is simply to make the data in Adapar a little tighter and the client much happier saying, somebody has checked my data and therefore I am now extremely confident of these numbers. Right, right, right. Because you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're providing this reconciliation mechanism across all of my different sources of data and you're Precisely. just identifying the disparities between Precisely. different sources of data and yeah. and giving people a pathway to either fix the problem or not right because i mean a lot of times in outer part we'll have a difference in posting date versus the statement and so we'll have a family office come to us and say hey look the statement mm -hmm. says x mm -hmm. and outer part says y we don't trust outer part all of a sudden and mm -hmm. so we're always stuck in that the like okay well let's go reconcile between the two and let's explain the difference and then we can override out of par if you want it to match the statement or not mm -hmm. and and you're right that that it takes uh, a, a lot of times several hours of a, mm -hmm. a human True, but what what we could do is we could automate or in that particular case in fact we're doing it with somebody else where we will automate that recount. So effectively what we'll say is if I'll take Adapar data and I adjust all the dates to match so-and-so, what is the number I will get? And uh, look at the number from the system, match the two, everybody's happy. Right. Um, right. And we could automate that check. So you could take in the statement data and that would just be an additional source of data, yeah. right? So we, we could we could understand the variance if- you know, And if explain we it to the sense, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes some sense. So- 
how does how are you guys using AI in coalition? So we believe very strongly in two or three things. First is that customers' data belongs to the customer. So data warehouse, full admin access. Um, uh, they even get a choice. If they want to host, they will host. Otherwise, we'll host for them, but they'll always get admin access. So that's our first principle. Second is best tool for the job. So there are certain problems that AI solves beautifully. And there are certain problems that AI is the wrong uh, wrong tool for it, um, especially in our space where uh, data accuracy uh, expectations are Six Sigma at the minimum, right? So people are, are very hyper-focused on, on that. And the good thing about uh, AI is that it'll solve unstructured problems, but the bad thing is it's also will give you slightly unreliable results, or you ask the same question five times, it'll give you five different answers, slightly different answers. So... Uh, there are certain problems where we use AI. So first is to understand uh, any complex document. So anything in PDF, bank statements or blah, blah, blah. And data that comes in and you're trying to make sense of it, uh, AI is ideally suited for that problem. Uh, one thing that we are very careful of is that uh, you have to make sure that you get the token size right. So you have to define the problem in a way that it fits the, the token size limit of your model. So if let's say we're typically using GPT-4 32K, so uh, you have to define the problem in 32K byte sizes. Uh, yeah. Luckily, most problems can be uh, solved that way. So uh, like even if you have a 200 page bank statement, uh, you can actually chop it up into smaller pieces, and, right. and you you can uh, you can do that. So uh, so that's uh, definitely one place. Another place where we use AI a lot is um, is um, plain English conversation. So uh, we've created this data warehouse. The client has uh, all their data in it, um, but the data warehouse only understands SQL, and client only understands English or you know, right. uh, Portuguese, um, and therefore you need a, a translator and it works beautifully. Um, and the and the best part is that we don't have to give any client data to GPT-4. GPT-4 only literally gets a document. It gets a text document, which describes the tables, describes the fields and describes the purpose behind the table. And that's Great. all GPT-4 uh, needs. And right. uh, it generates beautiful SQL queries, which yeah. you can cut paste into Excel. Um, yeah. And we are ourselves using it because some team members who are uh, not as comfortable in SQL and the SQL that's coming out is is amazing. As in, in fact, sometimes I look at it and say, wow, I wouldn't have done it as efficiently. So, uh, so, uh, so these are the problems, right? You know, unstructured data, plain English conversations, et cetera, where AI fits. Uh, but when you are doing a static data transformation, right? So when you know that your data source is Black Diamond and it needs to come into this data warehouse, into this data structure, uh, then you would much rather do it in Python than to do it in AI because you don't want different results every time. Right, 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 right. So, well, but it sounds like with the that AI engine that's creating the SQL, so you you could actually then do visualizations via natural language, right? right? Yeah. You could say, hey, look, I want to see the correlation between... Um, you know, cash, uh, well, uh, from, 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 uh, uh, highest MOIC, uh, to, uh, you know, cash, uh, yeah, in fact, in or fact, something uh, to that effect. Totally. Uh, on our LinkedIn side, there is actually a demo. So, uh, what, what we find people really like to do is to ask plain English and get the data into Excel as in get the results of the query yeah. into Excel, because everybody is extremely comfortable in Excel. Um, right. And um, so uh, ask plain English, get the data into Excel, and then do what you want. I mean, you want, want to plot it, you want to do calculation, you want to manipulate, not a problem. And and it works uh, worse every, every time. So um, not even Power BI. They prefer Excel because they want to touch and feel the data. Right. Um, and, well, and, in and finance, I, I mean, you know, I think, look, the, the, the finance community, we're, I, you know, I drove Excel 14 hours a day for a good 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, back in at Citigroup, uh, um, alternative investments, mm -hmm. and then prior with Milken. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're all so versed in Excel. And then when, when you, Power BI, I mean, it hasn't been around as long, it hasn't permeated the finance space as yeah. much as uh, it maybe in the tech space so it's just not as hmm. we're just not as comfortable with it but i still think it's a great tool uh, it, it, we use power bi a lot uh, but we use it for making dashboards and to give clients dashboards that are interactive that they power bi does amazing job uh, much better than excel would ever do 
but when it comes to actual, let me feel my data and let me ask the same question in five different ways and see if I get the same result, those kind of checks, um, I think are still very excellent. Yeah, so yeah. I think what's interesting though is the approach to using AI is to let it do what it's good at. That you're going to use it to grab the, um, the SQL commands, the joins, whatever those might be, or even the Power BI ideas, but not worry about having it try to do math on its own. Right? You're allowing it to kind of serve to that correct purpose. Precisely, um, and we found that. Uh... Uh, if you keep this philosophy of best tool for the job at the back of your mind, and also our clients are obsessive about data quality, right? So I cannot run the risk of, uh, you know, giving the same report on, you know, 15 minutes apart with two different results, right? I mean, mm -hmm. then you have a big problem in your hand. So, so you want to be at a point where you're very sure of your number. But, you know, I... It's it's but you are using AI in the in this capacity too, and I I think it is actually really powerful. Uh -huh. uh, is it you know finding a number in a big document, right? A specific number, okay? Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it is really good about finding that number. You know, a, a number that requires some semantic understanding mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to uh, find. Like for instance, the net asset value in a capital statement. Uh, right. It, you're right. In fact, it can, sorry to interrupt, but in, in fact, it can do better than that. So it can uh, even do things like um, I'm a trust document and, uh, you know, my my client wants to pull out this much money, can he? Um, and, right, right, right. And you, you will be able to, uh, to configure that. So um, uh, NAV and all these guys absolutely run a problem. And, and AI does an amazing job at it. Yeah. So what do you, ha have you ever contemplated like, I mean, I, I see some of the systems now are experimenting with uh, RAG type of solutions so that yeah. clients, you know, they don't have to log into the systems. They can ask the systems in natural language, you know, mm -hmm. specific questions and mm -hmm. they're able to generate answers. And and again, I think, you know, you maybe you would say that, well, you know, if, depending upon how you ask the question, you get five different, if you ask the question five different ways, you get five different answers. But that doesn't necessarily make it wrong as, as long as all five of those answers are correct. Um, <laughs> have you contemplated? Uh, any uh, uh, okay. Yes and no. I fully expect that this is, this is kind of going in that direction. And I suspect that's where we will end up uh, eventually. So um, uh, not in the rag sense. So, okay. First is uh, my client is actually not the principal of the family office. My client is the family office manager or the uh, person who's managing the data. And they have a very, very specific output in mind. They want exactly this because that's what the boss wants to see. So, uh, so at this stage, when the, you have a headache and you're not able to, um, uh, you know, get the number, your focus is, let me just get rid of the head first. Yeah, hyper focus on getting the number. Yeah. Right. Now, once you have solved the headache and the boss is happy with the number, at that point, boss will start asking sticky questions, saying, okay, you know, where did that happen? And that's where RAG comes in. So I'm seeing that as uh, the next step after the headache. So first you solve the headache, and then you kind of start asking, uh, you know, RAG kind of questions. I also expect it to go in a slightly different uh, path. And the path is that... Um, Right now, we are asking our client a lot of questions on their tech stack and their uh, pain. Where does it hurt? And what's the exact problem and all that? I expect the client, uh, and I don't think it's that far away. Um, I expect to have an AI-powered questionnaire, for the lack of a better word, where I'm, or the AI bot is asking them <clears throat> questions which are getting more and more relevant. And um, actually, it's basically configuring the solution for them. So what I showed you on the screen, which is you have bots going left and right, whatever, Right now, those bots are configured by us manually after kind of a, uh, you know, uh, talking to the client. Uh, I see that being replaced by, yeah, absolutely. So, so because, all the setup, just all yeah. the discovery being done. All the discovery, yeah. because it's 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 open-ended, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. also straight-jacketed in a way. So I see that happening. So I see RAG coming in and I see uh, plain English configuration of bots uh, coming in. I see these two as next steps once you've solved the headache. Well, and you mentioned token size too, correct? And as oh, that yes. continues to expand, you can just okay. ask more and more complex questions at the at, at the onset, Absolutely. right? And you don't so, even have to have that information to the side. 
exactly so right now we are limited um, you know at about three four pages five pages of document um and what we have found is that uh, some people are trying to make indexes and then and that uh -huh. doesn't doesn't give you the 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 the, the, the data quality you need uh, so we actually literally do a rolling uh, token thing, which gives us better results. Um, uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, Gemini said 1 million tokens. I'm like really looking forward to it and uh, really looking to try it out. Yeah, you know, I but I've been able to take like a whole subscription document mm -hmm. on uh, uh, Claude Anthropics, um, mm -hmm. in the, which has a much larger context window. Mm -hmm. It's able to get like all the relevant things, like mm -hmm. explain to me, how the waterfall works in nice. or give me a list of steps to calculate mm -hmm. the waterfall and it's pretty darn good i mean we we don't use it in production but we certainly mm -hmm. use it to short shorten the you know the the, the time it takes mm -hmm. to get to the the, the 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 spreadsheet that does it um so but I, you know i guess like what would be super cool is a rag type solution with your sql queries mm -hmm. uh, right so you could get data visualization through natural language sure. um uh requests because i i think a lot of the users that i deal with are not super tech savvy mm -hmm. you know the cfos the controller mm -hmm. uh some of the investment reporting folks like they're they they would much prefer not having to log into a system but be able to ask a natural language questions hence they have a yeah. a data analyst you know sitting in between them and the systems and and uh, to further your uh, comment, not only uh, but these guys, while they may not be good at SQL, they know exactly what they're looking for. Yes, so, yeah, they're so sophisticated. What, uh, so so what what I have seen is they will ask a question, uh, they'll get some answer very quickly. They'll figure out how do I need to ask my question slightly differently for me to narrow down into exactly uh, what I want. And it takes one or two attempts. So uh, you, it's it's brilliant to see. It's a lot of fun to see how quickly people get it. Well, and that's the beauty of the data warehouse. Ultimately, is that it gives you the option to do things that you exactly. couldn't do before. Because we talked about automating the other work, and that's absolutely valuable. But now, you know, you can ask questions that you might have thought no way, but you can keep on trying them, right? And then and you'll get figure it. out things you couldn't have seen. So are, do you guys roll your own data warehouse or are you using uh, off-the-shelf third-party data warehouse? Um, so uh, I think it's cost, time, and speed, which is of uh, essence. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just use off-the-shelf. So uh, we'll give client a choice on uh, technology. So if they want, uh, they will choose. Otherwise, we'll just set it up for them. And uh, we found we find that uh, more often than not, they already have a cloud set up with a, a service provider who's managing their access and security, whatever. So it's a relatively straightforward job to just work with them to create one and uh, give us access. Um, otherwise, we'll set them up for, I mean, at our end, it's like a couple of minutes. So it's not a problem. And are you tech stack ag agnostic? Like as long as these tech solutions have APIs and you can get access to the data, does it really matter for you what the specific tech stack is? Uh, not at all. Um, so uh, we are yet to find one which we could not work with. Okay. And then t tell me a little bit about how do you how do you price um, collation? Uh... Um, so uh, because we are typically uh, so if you think about it from a customer's point of view, we are typically replacing headcount um, and we are replacing a flexible headcount. And what I mean by flexible headcount is that, you know, first first half of the month, they're solving one problem and second half of the month, they're following right. another problem. So typically we end up being about one third to one fourth the cost of a single headcount. That's typical pricing, uh, but we will be doing the work of four or five feet. So that is the kind of, uh, uh, you know, pricing point, whatever. So uh, it ends up being, you know, 20, 30K US per annum. Uh, um, and that includes the whole service. Uh, you know, we'll set it up, we'll run the box um, and we can price by task. We can price, uh, you know, as a service, whatever you feel. Uh, but in our experience, people prefer that we price it as a service uh, because uh, then we are on the hook for everything. If the if the bot is having an off day, then it's our problem, or you know the server needs to be patched, it's our problem, and all that. So is is basically what we are uh, there for, and what we have to do. Uh, so that seems to be the kind of sweet spot. So about um, uh, slightly more than what you would maybe what you would pay an intern, I suppose. <laughs> it's, it's what you pay. Us. Right, right, right. In this day and age, yeah. So 
So, and then tell me a little bit about where is Collation AI in, it, it, how many employees do you have? How, you know, where, where are you? We are, we are very much, uh, very much in the startup phase. We are about nine people at this point, uh, but we are growing rapidly. So we haven't finished a year. We already hit 250K ARR. We will hit 500K very soon. Um, and uh, see, what happens here is that in my earlier company, Canopy, our client segment was somebody who was willing to replace a system. Uh, and that's a big decision. And, you know, it's a smaller market and it takes a lot of time. Uh, in Collation, we are asking for zero change. It's a no surgery solution. So so uh, we are simply saying, do you have a headache? In fact, we are yet to find a customer who does not have a data headache. So right. so, so it massively increases the... The, the, the trustful market. Yeah. Um, and uh, it also decreases the, the time to market. As in, uh, because you go in and essentially we're saying uh, we will, we actually time it. So within two days after getting API access, the data starts flowing. And you're kind of done in two weeks. So, so the for the client, it's it's like an aspirin, right? You eat it, and that pain goes away. So, it's a much easier sell, uh, and therefore we're very excited about where we are and how we're do, how we're going with this. All right, awesome. Well, look, I really, really appreciate you guys okay. coming on to to talk about Correlation AI. You know, I'm super excited about the solution because it. You, we, you, we, we speak the same language. We, we <laughs> suffered the same pain. Uh, you know, my team <laughs> suffered the same pain. So, um, super fun to to get you awesome. on to, to talk about this, and we look forward to uh, to working with you in the future. Thank you. So again, uh, Hanmai and Manish, thank you, uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.